Betty on this one having to do with redistricting. Okay. Uh, there was a strong reaction from, from a number of segments of Sacramento community reaction to this city's redistricting process and despite strong opposition from African American and Latino communities and business community and others, the city council voted to approve the district maps that would be in effect for the next 10 years. What also has become apparent are fissures and divisions on the city council itself. On what side did you land regarding the redistricting map that was finally approved by the city council and why? Well, I didn't agree with the city council map that they put together 45 minutes prior to um, the city council meeting. I absolutely didn't agree with that. I did not agree with the fact that Sac High was on there originally. It's the oldest or the second oldest high school west of the Mississippi. The minute that came, would have came across my desk, I would have told them no deal. We shouldn't have done that. It shouldn't have happened. We had over 800 people that showed up in that community and no one listened to them. So the fact that we had individuals that were so passionate about let's vet this, let's talk this through, and the city council refused to do that, I absolutely did not agree with the existing map. Thank you. Ms. Pinnell. We've worked on redistricting in for one year. Grantland Johnson was my appointee on that panel. They went around the community, the city, to every community and talked about the process. Oak Park was had a strong committee. They submitted the map with UC Davis in the Amherst area. So I supported the map. We had Sakai drawn out of Oak Park. That was a mistake. We fixed the mistake. We put Sakai back into Oak Park where it belongs and it is and UC Davis is in the Elmhurst area. The hospital did not move, it's still there. Okay. Thank you. This is going to begin with Ms. Bunnell, having to do with the proposed water and sewage infrastructure project. And then this is Williams. Uh, recent public uh, meetings have been held on whether to approve the massive 2.4 billion utilities infrastructure project financed by 10 to 15 percent annual hikes projected in water and sewage rates in the next three years. With, with, with further major hikes projected in uh, each of the following 12 years, together with more than 1 billion in new city borrowings, making it the largest public works project in the region's history and also the largest general fee hike in the city. Please share your position on this project. As you know, I voted against the project because the fees, as you said, are very high. I know we need to replace our pipes, but not all at once. If you look at the map, the map affects Meadowview, Land Park, downtown, and Del Paso Heights. Part of our the city is run through the city of Sacramento. The other half is through regional sand. So not all of the city is are paying those fees. So I had received so many letters from community members and business folks that were against the rate increase. So sometimes you have to vote with people and I voted with the people. Ms. Betty, do you need me to read it again? Or do you Regarding the, the infrastructure? Well, yes, the infrastructure. I, it's kind of convoluted. If you want, I can read it again. Could you believe? Sir, no problem. Recent public meetings have been held on whether to approve a massive $2.4 billion, billion utilities infrastructure project financed by 10 to 15 percent annual hikes projected in water and sewer rates in the next three years, with further major hikes projected in each of the following areas over the next 12 years. Together with more than one billion in new city borrowings, making it the city's uh, making it the largest public works project in the region's history, and also the largest general fee hike in the city's history. Please share your thoughts, your position on this project, and why. 
Well, first of all, I, I'm very concerned about the overall uh, decision having to come to the city council in the first place. Because we've been dealing with this for over a decade, and what we lacked was infrastructure, what we lacked was planning, what we lacked was not enough information so that we wouldn't get to the point of having to do the hikes or the, the fee hikes. And now we're at a place where our pipes are being destroyed. We're at a place where the overall structure has to be over or revamped, and now we have to pay for it. And to say no at this point after we didn't have a plan decades ago is not a good answer for this. At this point, we need to look at it and we need to fix the pipes. And so I am looking in supporting that, but it's because we've been put in a place where you didn't cut off every limb and you have no choice but to cut off the last foot. So we have to make a choice to make sure these pipes are fixed because the planning wasn't there prior to that vote. Thank you. And Betty, you will have the first uh, response to the question on proposed budget cuts. Proposed budget cuts, and then this will now follow. Since 2008, the city has found itself, has found itself reducing service hours, closing programs used by children and seniors, and discounting altogether other city services. This, uh, this year, the city is expecting its budget deficit to be 27 million in the current fiscal year. Uh, what set of criteria do you use to determine how and what we can cut or scale back in order to achieve a balanced budget? One of the things that I have always said that when it comes to public safety, I'm concerned because police and fire came in the very beginning of giving concessions. They understood there was a budget crisis here in the city of Sacramento. So they went and cut themselves. And so they came back and said, please don't cut us again. These are all the things that we've done to make it work. But they were cut again. There were other unions and organizations never gave any concessions, not one. So one of the things that I will look at when looking at the budget is looking at those individuals who never gave any concessions, the unions that didn't do anything. And then we need to look at the pension um, and pension reform and looking at people um, giving more into their pension than what they're doing now. However, I don't think we should start there. We absolutely need to start with the individuals that gave no concessions at all and then go from there. Thank you. Ms. Pennell, do you need me to read it again? Yes. Okay. Uh, <coughs> since 2008, again, it's proposed budget cuts. Since 2008, the city has found itself reducing service hours, closing programs and uh, used by children and seniors and discounting altogether other city services. This year, the city is expecting its budget deficit to be 27 million in, current fiscal, in the current fiscal year. What set of criteria will you use to determine how and what will be cut or scaled back in order to achieve a balanced budget? Uh, I started paying for my pension January 1st, 7%. And police and fire, there were no layoffs in fire, and there were layoffs in police. They were hired back by grants. We've lost over a thousand people in the last four years. So I support pension reform. Okay, and for uh, and at this point, I'm going to kind of uh, remind the audience to start pinning those questions and cue cards because immediately after this next question, it's going to be your opportunity to kind of answer. So this is my last question, official question. Uh, I'm going to begin with Ms. Pinnell and I'm going to go to Ms. Betty and let you guys do your uh, questions from the audience. This has to do. This is pretty much a open question. Uh, other issues facing the city kind of question. What other cities, what other issues do you see as uh, the most important issues facing the city council? And where do you stand on, on those issues? So it's kind of an open scale. What do you think is the most important? What issues are facing? Public safety, greenways on the streets, our seniors, our kids. Our kids need something to do after school. 
That's always been a problem. We need to keep our community centers over, open, our pools over, open. So those are the issues I see facing the city. Okay. And jobs. Of course, we need jobs. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Betty, do you need me to? No, that's okay. Um, I've knocked on more than 5,000 households. And they do agree with me that public safety is a priority because police officers did get cut. They do believe that and we need more jobs in the community because there's a lot of unemployment there. They do believe that city council should have a relationship with the school district to support our failing schools. But in addition to talking to those 5,000 individuals, they did have a concern with the existing illegal dumping in the street and the people not picking it up in time or in a timely manner. They did have a, an overwhelming pride of their city parks and that the upkeep of the parks are, are not being kept. And in certain areas, they are looking more for a grocery store than a Home Depot because their family needs to eat. So when I talk to my community, that's what I hear and I agree with them, that we need more support through our law enforcement, more support when it comes to jobs, and more support when it comes to our education. Thank you. So this next round of questions, and thank you for uh, enduring these uh, three pronged questions that uh, I've been throwing at you here. Uh, the next set of questions, uh, as I look at them, some of them are very difficult too, but uh, some of them are very heartfelt and from the audience. And to that, we're going to give you at least a, a minute to respond to these questions. And uh, we're going to begin uh, with Betty and then we're going to go to Ms. Okay. So um, the first question reads, uh, what is your vision to connect District 8 to economic development planning in the Sacramento region? And then uh, there's a part two to that question. Uh, what strategies would you employ to support African American access to participating in the process? Part one is your vision to connect District 8 to economic development plan in the Sacramento uh, region, and then uh, what would you employ to support African American access to participate in that process? The vision as far as um, economics in, in my district is basically to work with um, the city officials and the developers and the business people. One of the first things I want to do is bring them in and talk about uh, the lack of resources and the duplication of process. So one of the first things we need to do is streamline the existing process in order to make our community a business friendly community. And the second part as far as access to African Americans, is that correct? The access to the plan, participation of that, and planning of that. Um, in order to have access, you need to know that you have access. And I think being a president of the NAACP, I've learned many times that African Americans don't have the information in order to either grow their business, have a business, or know where to start. So we need to do a better job, and I think through the African American Leadership Coalition should be one to make sure that you will always have the information. I think NACP, Urban League, and the other African American entities, and especially the churches. Thank you. Ms. Uh, Pinnell, do you want me to read it? District 8 was the second highest growth area in the city of Sacramento. But that means $1 billion worth of projects, 14,000 jobs in the last 13 years. And I'm just one person. I depend on the NAACP and the Black Chamber to help me with black businesses. And as far as the grocery store in Meadowview, the space left in Meadowview at Freeport, Amherst, and Meadowview, they're getting a fresh and easy grocery store. Uh, it's been approved, by the way. Thank you. And we'll begin with uh, Ms. Pinnell with this question, and then we'll go to Ms. Williams with this part two. What is your position on uh, on a city private, 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 well, privatizing public jobs? What is your position on 
the city's privatizing public jobs? We've just privatized golf, and a lot of good people who's worked there for 20 years lost their jobs. So I'm against privatizing jobs, public jobs. Okay. Ms. Williams. I think um, we need to look at that and look at whether it's something good for the entire community. Before I give an answer on something like that, it's important to me if it's not good for the community as far as making sure that we have jobs increase or no one is losing opportunities, I, I think we need to look more into what the, um, what would help our community or if this would help our community. Thank you. Uh, okay. Let's see. Am I next? Yes. Okay. I thought you I could say. Oh, I answered it while you were talking to. While I was talking to my <laughs> person. Okay. Um, let's go on to the next question. How's okay. that? Is that fair? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, it sounds like this is directed um, towards Miss Williams initially. And with the rules being that if something's directed to us, one of our panel, the other panel will have the opportunity, the same opportunity to respond. Okay. So, Ms. Williams, please summarize your uh, successes that have positively uh, impacted black youth and black parents. I believe the uh, parent advocacy program that the NACP uh, put together to teach parents how to advocate for their children because we had so many. Also, as president of the NACP, I was responsible for the oversight of the Sheriff's Department, which means there was a third party that looks at the interaction with the African American community and Latinos. I've been responsible for free legal clinics that has happened for the past seven years. Um, so individuals who do not have access to attorneys, I have that in place. In addition to that, um, the Sacramento branch of the NACP had an, an RFP that was um, that I wrote for crime prevention. 5,000 units applied for that. Only two were eligible. I was one of the two that was um, given. Crime prevention in Fort Lauderdale was the, the next one. And in jobs, in, in job fairs that I've done over the past 10 years. So at this point, Ms. Pinnell, you could kind of uh, extrapolate maybe on your, uh, your successes. Needless to say, I'm not going to ask you to extrapolate on her successes. So take the time, uh, take the minute, and kind of drill down a little bit on your own successes that you've had. My biggest success is Franklin Villa. It was crime-ridden, drug-infested, and 20-some young people lost their lives in there. There has not been a homicide slash murder since 2006. We cleaned that place up. We cleaned up Danger Island. We have a parent university in Phoenix Park. The kids are doing great. The kids, uh, the majority of the kids attend, attend Parkway Elementary School. They are doing great. Thank you. So this is going to be, I'm going to initial, initially send this to Ms. Pinnell and then to Ms. Williams. Pretty general question, what is your vision for Sacramento? My vision for Sacramento is the course, the rail yards. We have 240 undeveloped land there. We need flood protection for Natomas and parts of South Sacramento. Meadowview now has a hundred year flood protection. We need to expand that from the railroad tracks to Highway 99. We have Delta Shores that is 1.5 acres of retail housing, a regional park, several parks schools, and police station. 
I'm working on Scott's Lane Phase 2 to Consumers River College. There's also light rail to the airport. We're extending the airport. Phase 1 of the airport line to, I forgot the name, Scott Syfax Project. Township 9. Town, thank you. Okay. So uh, this is uh, in turn pointed initially to Ms. Pinnell, and then uh, however you want to take that opportunity to uh, add your own hook to it, that's fine with me. Is that okay? That's fine. Okay. Uh, Ms. Pinnell. Uh, you have repeatedly stated uh, that crime in District 8 has decreased. There have, however, been many recent outbreaks of shootings and robberies on Mack Road almost every day in the past week. Do you find this to be a primary issue to uh, an issue uh, to put out before building more homes and parks in the community? Is that clear? That's not true. Not true. Not sure where the information came from. That is blatantly not true. And Ms. Williams, do you have that minute? Um, actually, it is true because my campaign office sits right on back. Um, I'm even within my own um, campaign. I had to reach out to the police officers because of home invasion. Um, that because of the cuts of the police force, they could not go to that home invasion. They had to either go on a computer and file the complaint or go to the Freeport office and file the complaint. They physically could not go because of the budget cuts for city police. Um, on a daily basis, we're looking at the helicopters. On a daily basis, we are to ourselves have been approached and almost attacked. My own home had an assistant, uh, a burglary. So what is happening is it's not being reported as often because we don't have the police officers to report it. Because of the budget cuts, they don't have the uh, resources to report it. So if you look at the existing document, you won't see it because they don't have the officers to report it. Thank you. So Ms. Williams, this is uh, not directed to you, but this is just a question that you can begin and then Ms. Penelope. Currently, police officers are used on school sites. Is there a role for the city to uh, is is there a role for the city to monitor this partnership? With Sacramento uh, Unified School District, at at this point, I don't think so. Only because we don't have um, some of the issues that Twin Rivers have. Um, actually, we haven't had any of the issues that Twin Rivers had, and so. Our city police um, have done a better job when it comes to the, I'm sorry, our school police have done a better job. Um, however, they need to work with uh, city police and not work as an island. Thank you. Ms. Pinnell, I'll read the question. Thank you. Maybe get a sense from it. Currently, police officers are used uh, on uh, school sites. Uh, is there a role for the city to monitor this partnership? Now, if, even if you don't agree with the premise, there's a, you know, sometimes I think the last question, you didn't agree with the premise, and, I, and that's understandable, but address it any way you want to, based on their question. Uh, I thought we, the city police was monitoring the police on the schools. I thought, I'm not sure. I have one more point on macro, we implemented the Boston Ceasefire. We have ministers walking these streets at least three times a week. So the premise that there's been shootings and crime on macro is beyond me. They not reported that. So let's take the next question, shall we? Um, and this will go to Ms. Pinnell and then Ms. Williams. Okay? Okay. It says, um, are you in support of using campgrounds uh, sites <coughs> for the homeless community? And how does uh, 
Delta Shores help or uh, help or not benefit this issue of homeless in District 8? I'm not support, in support of using campgrounds for the homeless. I think campgrounds are substandard. Everybody needs a house. And we're going to build in Delta Shores affordable to low income houses. That's already in the plan. So everyone should have a, a roof over their house, not living outdoors. Do you want me to read the question again? I know, uh, I, I think I got it. Um, when it comes to um, homelessness and individuals staying on campgrounds, I think you can't just have one general answer. You have to deal with it in different departments, such as you have the mental health, and so you have to deal with the mental health issues. You have people with addictions, and so you have to deal with the addiction issues. And then you have the homeless issues where individuals have children, and so I do believe they need to be in homes, but you cannot put everyone in a house without dealing with the symptoms that they have. So you absolutely have to deal with the other issues as far as mental health, drug addiction, and the homelessness. And then there's individuals, especially being working for the census in the past years, I discovered that individuals want to live on campgrounds, so I think it needs to be an option as well. Okay, so I'm gonna give you another one of those uh, three questioners, but uh, we'll, we'll take them in, in time and stride here. But uh, there's, this has to do with uh, commercial industry in District 8 and African American ownership. We'll begin with Ms. Betty and then we'll go to Ms. Pinnell. But uh, I'll start with the, the first question. And some of this may be redundant, but we'll try to uh, piece it out because we should flush this piece out here. What can be done to increase African American ownership of commercial property in District 8? And I will continue. What can be done to support black business growth in these commercial strips? And then, um, sac uh, what industries in the Sacramento region do you believe can be tapped to create jobs in District 8? So there's, there's three really somewhat different questions. The last question is a little different than the, the first two, but uh, jump in <laughs> however you wish. Okay, the first question when it comes to commercial ownership in District 8, I do believe there's an opportunity to educate our African American community through the Realtors Association. There's something that I started uh, prior to me stepping down as the NACP through our housing um, chair because there is a challenge with not just commercial ownership but people owning homes. So we started a program, a 12 to 18 month program to teach individuals in the African American community on how to become an owner on commercial, commercial as well as residential um, home ownership. When it comes to black business growth, I think there's a lack of information and that we need to partner more, not just with the chambers, but we need to partner with the Urban League and the ALC, AL, a, a, I don't know, I this name, AALC, as well as the NACP and bring them all in one room. And I think we need to teach them and bring them together on what the process is. Lack of knowledge and you die. And so I think we need to increase the knowledge. And I think we, the city has done a very good job of that. And your final question was having, something with industries. Yeah, having to do with industries. What, can you, what industries could be brought into this district here? What industries? I think um, if we work with a faith base, if uh, more often in teaching them on how to build economically. For example, if you have some, some churches have already started this, if they can just take a block, and each block would, they say, we're gonna have a store, and then we're gonna have a, a restaurant, and they would employ, teach them. And that we'll, we'll, give you, we'll give you 30 seconds uh, here more to finish that part off. But if each church, especially African American churches, took ownership of a block, and they build up businesses within the block of their church. That also brings economic growth, job secure. It will also bring in insurance opportunities. So I think we need to teach our churches, which is a huge commodity when it comes to the African American community, to build. And that's what I think when we look at an industry in the African American community, we need to look at that uh, as well as some others, but starting. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Uh, Ms. Pinnell. 
I'll do with you and we'll extend the same time. Commercial ownership Yeah. Is the first question. Yeah, uh, what can be done to increase African American ownership of commercial uh, property in District 8 is the first question. Second question, and I'll hold on the third question, what can be done to support black business growth in these commercial strips? I imagine areas. Commercial ownership, we need to probably look at the Asian community and Hispanic community. They work together, put their money together, and purchase property. Seafood City on Macro, Asian money. Working together, pulling their money to buy property. Hong Kong Plaza, Asian money. Working together one more time, pulling their money to build that property outright. They own the property. So we need to work together. Is something hard for us to do? Okay. And we'll extend the 30 seconds to this uh, third, third question here. Uh, what industries uh, in the Sacramento region uh, do you believe uh, can be tapped uh, to create jobs in District 8? What industries? Hospitals, hospital. We have Kaiser, Methodist, Sierra Vista. They buy supplies. There are plenty of opportunities for hospital support. Thank you. So I'm going to begin with uh, Ms. Pinnell on this question and then go to Ms. Williams. Um, this has to do again with schools and, and the viability of, of schools and kind of your opinion and you can kind of drill down again, you'll have a minute. Uh, if the governor's initiative uh, does not pass, what is your opinion to keep schools open, viable, and strong? Geez, it takes money to keep schools open. So you guys need to support the initiative. Ms. Williams, uh, the same. Do you need me to read it again, or do you have? Um, if the initiative does not pass, what should we do? Yes. Is that the question? Yes, to keep uh, schools strong, open, viable. I think that we need to work together as a community to keep the schools strong, open, and vital, but because I think we need to do more. Um, one of the things, because of uh, the programs that we are losing because of the budget cuts on the statewide level, we're losing tutoring, we're losing mentorship, and I think, again, the organizations that we have within our community, the churches that we have in our community, pull in the retired teachers, tell them to come to the churches. Let's start creating the things that are missing or that was cut if it doesn't pass and start working together within our, within our own community. And I think that's where we should start, working together as um, retirees, teachers, and churches. That's where I think we should start. We're gonna switch gears beginning with